Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. You went on holiday for a week. And you've come back completely insane. What happened? (laughs) Uh, um, Can you tell me a bit more? Well, you've been in the Karoo, and I think you got dehydrated because you're talking about Bitcoin as an investment. Or did I not read far enough in the email? I was so shocked and appalled um, that you've gone over to the dark side. Of course, I'm joking. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that you are even contemplating a discussion on on Bitcoin. Well, well, well I think it, uh, it, you know um, some of the ideas that we have for for the show are, are from questions that we get from people and and you know discussions that that I just in general have, and and Bitcoin is becoming a, <clears throat> a topic again. So, so I think it's worth talking about, and it's it's really interesting that, that it comes up when the share price, or not the share price, but the price of Bitcoin is rocketing, and and you know for the Bitcoin followers, you, you know it's it, they'll know that it's up more than one hundred and fifty percent in dollars for for this year so far. Uh, and what's interesting is there are things that are happening in the Bitcoin world, or, or let's just say the whole cryptocurrency world. Uh, that, that are starting to make them a little bit more mainstream than they were, where, you know, when we started to chat about them on the show probably three years ago. Uh, and, and you know, some of the interesting things are, you know, one of the very big fund managers in the world is a is a company called Fidelity, uh, and, and they've actually launched a unit trust that that only owns Bitcoin. So so now you know it's not available to everyone. I think you need a hundred thousand dollars as a minimum investment to go into it. But 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 it's it's a, a very large player in in the world markets in the world unit trust market that's now offering a fund uh, solely invested in one thing, Bitcoin. And and that that starts to nudge it into the mainstream somewhat. And then we see a company like PayPal, you know, which is I mean not not that big in South Africa, but a massive payments business that is saying. We'll use uh, we'll use cryptocurrencies as a form of exchange and and to start uh, you know Bitcoin it hasn't happened just yet but it's but it's it, that, that, you know I think it'll be early 2021 so so all of a sudden it's something we have to talk about Bruce we can't uh, we, we can't ignore it anymore it, it doesn't mean uh, you know uh, to, to your point that the the, the fresh air of the career has changed my mind but but certainly uh, you know it's something that people are, are discussing more and more you know and and I think we need to have a view as investors as to what we want to do with this you know is it something that someone like me who was saying for the last few years you know avoid should, should i be jumping in now or or not and 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 i think you know to, to cut my, my very long story short i uh, i think the fact that a price of something shoots up you know it always attracts attention but but the more um the, the price shoots up the less interested i am in buying it because i always think it creates its own herd mentality you know and i think something like bitcoin there's actually not a lot of supply of Bitcoin available. So, you know, if you and I decide we want to buy some Bitcoin uh, because we had too much to drink uh, and, and suddenly, you know, we, we become buyers in, in, in that market, we could push the price up quite a bit because there are not a lot of people who will sell Bitcoin to us. So, so whatever is available for sale can actually, uh, you know, because it's such a small amount, anyone who buys with a little bit of volume can can push that price up massively. And I think and that's, that's what's the, happening that's- at, that's the argument that the the the, the math nerds, um, people like Simon Dingle, who wrote a very very good book in math we trust, um, and, and uh, as a very strong proponent from a dollar uh, per Bitcoin, he um, you know was very 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 outspoken on, on on Bitcoin and its value as as an investment back then, and this was you know more than a decade ago when I should have listened to him, but I didn't. Um, and so we, we now look at it at around $20,000, maybe it's down to $18,000 or whatever the level is right now, it doesn't really matter. It becomes far more, uh, there's far more chatter about it, far more discussion about it, far more hype around it, because that's when people start talking about the prospects of investing. And you and I know that generally speaking, and it may or may not be true in this particular case, but generally speaking, when the chatter levels rise it is precisely then that you should be doing the opposite 100 uh, percent you know my my um, beloved hairdresser hates me uh talking about him but but you know when, when my hairdresser starts to ask me uh you know about an investment then that's the classic sign because he's been listening to you know his clients who are coming into the salon and they're definitely not financial services people uh 
and and so you know when that becomes a theme across the whole investment market, then you know it's time to be very very careful. And and I'm not for a minute saying that you know you know Bitcoin couldn't double again. You know, it couldn't go. You know, it might well go from eighteen thousand to thirty six thousand. But what it has showed us very clearly, and not long ago, is that it can go from eighteen thousand to below five thousand, and it can do it incredibly fast. And that's the thing that I don't like about it. You know, to to me. Uh, you, you know, investment that's not correlated to to shares, and and you know, just to, to talk about the jargon. So correlation just means it doesn't move in the same pattern as the stock market or the property market or the bond market. An uncorrelated investment is a very good thing usually, but it needs to be somewhat predictable. It needs to be something that you can try and calculate a value for it, and that for me is the fundamental flaw that Bitcoin has today. Is uh, I can't, you know, I can't sit down with any math genius and say let let's work out two or three reasonable scenarios as to what we think Bitcoin's going to do based on some valuation. There isn't a valuation. It's what people think. Other people think uh, it's going to do, and that and that becomes a very tricky way to make money. So how is for that me, different? Uh, how is that different though to any other asset at all? I mean, if I think. Steinoff is going to go to two rand from one rand or wherever it is trading at the moment. I haven't bothered looking for an awfully long time. I can think that. And many other people might think that. And the share price may briefly go to two rand. I mean, it's, that happens in stock markets too, doesn't it? It does. And 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 certainly over very short periods of time, you know, what other people think is a big driver of, of, of the price of a share. However, what, what, what we can do is we could look at a company and we can say, this company generates real revenue. We can actually go and, and measure it. And, you know, hopefully one day we can trust the audit standards again and we can trust the financials of the companies. Uh, and we can say, this company is generating X amount of revenue. It spends a bit less than what it earns uh, every year, so it's making some profit. And guess what? It pays out a dividend, and it's something we can calculate. And and so we could say to ourselves, if we bought it at fifty bucks and it went to thirty bucks, that's it's a really I mean that's lousy, and that's you know by, by no means uh, you know good call then. But it will be generating dividends. It'll be it's still making profits. So the share price is not the sole thing that determines the prospect of the company. And if we wait a while, hopefully that, that share price recovers. In the meantime, we're earning our dividends. Uh, and, and there is some sort of a measure of value that we can calculate. And, and if it really goes badly, you, you know, we can break it up and sell it for some assets. And you, know, you can sell the furniture and the computers and the leases and all of those kinds of things to use your, your Steinoff example. So you can come up with, a, with two or three different scenarios of, of how to value a company. But for something like Bitcoin, there, there isn't. There is no. There is no intrinsic value of the thing. It doesn't generate uh, interest. It doesn't generate dividends, uh, and and it can go up or down solely based on 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 what people think other people want to do with it. And and for me, that's tricky. But if I was going to talk to somebody like Fazam Esani, very clever guy, he used to head up the cryptocurrency desk at RMB, and subsequently started up his own cryptocurrency trading platform. He will tell you that, you know, cryptos are the future. You're mad not to have some exposure to some cryptocurrency, whether it be Bitcoin or whether it be any one of the others. Um, you, you've got to be in this space as a 21st century citizen and investor. So, so I think this is where I can I can start to tiptoe a little bit more into my comfort zone, which, which is to say that uh, in the very near future, there will be, you know, maybe one, but but, but very soon, 10, 20 and 100 different uh, exchange traded funds that, of cryptocurrencies. And, and so I think for someone that, you know, that, that wants to put their toe in the water, that for me would be a much more logical and rational way of, of doing it. Uh, but, but what I would say is, you know, that if you're going to take exposure to something like this, make sure that it's, you know, you know, it needs to be a little bit meaningful, I guess. But but no more than so, sort of five percent of the value of your of your wealth. You know, it's it's really it is still a massive punt. It might it might one day turn into something more sustainable. And you know, this is not a horse race. You don't need to get in right at the beginning to make money out of investment. You can get in a bit later than everybody else. But uh, but you know, I would hate to ride. This thing from you know eighteen thousand back to four thousand again, and, and you know just be, and the only reason I was in there at eighteen thousand was because of FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. I think that's that's a lousy uh, re reason to make investment decisions. But it may so, so never go back to five thousand again. So uh, I'm going to wait for it to go back to five thousand because in the past it has done that, but it may never do that again. It may just keep ticking upwards, and therefore I am going to have 
excess FOMO because it's going to go from 20 to 30 to 40. At some point, it's going to do this. And then I'm going to go, you know what? That Ingram guy is crazy and I better buy some at 40. Then it'll go back down to five. <laughs> Yeah, that, that'll be the day. It'll go to five. You're right, and 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 so I think uh, you know the the one thing is about investments is the the the, the trick to long term investment success is not uh, catching every great investment uh, on, on its way up. The, the, the real trick is to avoid the biggest losers, and and we will all make mistakes, and we will all have losers in our portfolios. But you want the least number of losers. It's not the greatest number of winners, and it's not semantics. You know, that's that, that that's really what it's all about, and and I think. To me, that's my attitude to something like this is I'm, I'm, I might miss out and that'll be okay. As long as I don't make huge mistakes that, that lose me uh, capital permanently, I don't mind missing out on, on some great investments that I just didn't make because I'm making other ones that are doing well. You know, and, and back to the index example again. Yeah, I mean, it's your, your good friend uh, and guru, Warren Buffett, says, you know, in stock markets, you've just got to do more things right than wrong and you'll be okay. Um, and it can be 51, you know, 49, but you were ideally 60, 40 or 70, 30. Um, but you're not going to get every bet right. And, and that is, I think, the point. And, and, and I mean, I like your wording there because you, you know, it, you, you're saying bet. And I think that is the point. Here. It, it is some kind of a bet uh, it, it, still, I think, to buy cryptocurrency. And, and I think one of the world's great investors, you know, pre, predating Warren Buffett was uh, Sir, John, uh, Sir, yeah, Sir John Templeton. And you know he, he calculated, I think, that he was right 51% of the time in his career, and and he was a very great, successful, and good investor for himself and for everybody else that that, that followed him. So so absolutely, I think you know you can uh, you, you can just avoid a few mistakes and and be pretty successful, but by, by not chasing every single winner. It really worries me when when we kind of get into that mentality, you know, as an investor population, and we, and we do it time and time again. Uh, and, and I think this is one of those times where, you know, we, we can just stay out of this and, and enjoy, enjoy watching the ride. You know, we don't need to be part of the ride. Warren Ingram, he is a personal financial advisor. He's executive director at Galileo Capital. If you think I was mean to him on Bitcoin, just wait till we start talking about the currency and the exchange rate. Um, I, that's a, this is a good discussion. When is the rand stronger and when is it because the dollar is weaker? And when is it because the dollar is stronger against the pound and the pound weaker against the euro, the euro and the cross? Oh, my goodness gracious me. Hopefully, we've got a simple explanation for this, Warren, in a moment. The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. Gaynor's question to us this week. When reporting on the Rand dollar exchange rate, if the Rand is strengthened, it is sometimes attributed to Rand strengthened and at other times to dollar weakness. Could Warren please explain how it is determined whether a change in exchange rates is due to the Rand or the dollar? Good luck on that one, Warren Ingram. I just want to say uh, to, to Gaynor, thanks so much for the question. And um, and um, I actually like the question. I must say, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, I actually had to go and do some um, homework. But but my real point here is, please send us more questions. We love these questions. And it gives me lots of uh, things to go and study up on. You know, as the financial nerd, I, I love this stuff. So, 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 so Gaynor, um, I think there's an easy way to check. And, and, and there is actually a, a thing called the US dollar index. Uh, and, and so, so if you just go and Google U.S. dollar index, you can actually see the performance of the U.S. dollar against a, a basket of other currencies, um, you know, other major currencies. And and what you would see is if that index is rising, because they actually show it in a nice graph. You know, and I, I like pictures. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not, not the cleverest guy around, so pictures always work for me. And you know, if that graph is rising, it tells you that the dollar dollar is getting stronger uh, com- compared to its main trading partners or you know this basket of other currencies and if that graph is going down then then you know that the dollar is getting weaker so for example now this year uh, you know the, the, this index was uh, at about just on, on a level of about 100 um, and at the moment it's on a on a level of, of about 90 in other words the dollar has lost 10% in value um, in comparison to things like the euro, the, the yen, you know, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, trading currencies. So, so it tells you that, uh, that if we were looking at, at you know, the, 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 this year um, and the dollar's done what it's done, that a lot of the RAND's improvement is down to the dollar getting weaker. So, so that, that's a starting point for me. And, uh, you know, when, when I look at this is... Uh, Almost always, uh, the, the answer will be gain, or that it's actually got a lot more to do with the dollar than it has with the rand. And and the re- the real reason for that is we we we, we in the world uh, you know in the world markets we were a tiny little country with a very small economy, 
you know, and and yes, we've got a very liquid uh, currency. You know, you know, the rand is is something that can easily be bought and sold by by foreigners all around the world. But but what that actually means is that when they become fearful, when foreigners become fearful, they will run away from uh, from emerging markets, and especially then, you know, the rand will be affected, and they will go and buy dollars, which is exactly what happened earlier this year, and the dollar was really strong against every other major currency because the world was, you know, deeply worried about what's going to happen with with COVID. W- when that kind of moved out of the uh, out of the world's kind of radar, and they started to look at you know, beyond 2020 and looking at 2021, that the world became a bit less fearful. And and so they started to move out of the dollar again. And surprise, surprise, the rand started to strengthen. So in most instances, it's got a lot more to do with, with the dollar and a lot less to do with the rand. What will happen, though, is if there is a major move in, in the world markets and, and the rand, uh, you know, all emerging market currencies, for example, start to get stronger, the rand might perform particularly well if we're doing things well as a country and you know and and sentiment is positive towards us or it could do a bit a bit worse than the, you know the other currencies out there if we're not doing well you know so so that's you know, you know for me that's the, the the kind of signal and i always think about uh, the, the rand actually strengthened on the day that uh, that zuma was announced um, as as pr- president of the anc uh, and that you know that and and the reason that the rand strengthened on that day was nothing to do with with Zuma being announced president of the ANC. It had a lot to do with what was going on in in the rest of the world. So, so but, unfortunately, uh, you know, but on the do, day uh, on the on the day uh, Jacob Zuma fired in Tlantlanene, the rand collapsed and uh, and fell very very sharply. It it did. So so th- there will be the catastrophic event that that will that will cause the rand to to lose a lot of value on that day. But, uh, but, but I mean, you know, to give it a consideration, you know, I mean, that was, I, I can remember it, um, I think it was, wasn't it four years ago, almost to the day. Uh, and, and I can remember, you know, driving back from the Karoo thinking, you know, the, the world had nearly ended. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that was the, the scale of the event that could move the round. But that's not, th- th- those events are, are quite rare still, uh, you know, in our, in our lives as a country. No. So, so most hey. of the time it's about the dollar. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on that, Warren. Let me just a quick quiz to you, a quick quiz question for you. In the last five years, what is the strongest the rand has been, and when? To the dollar. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm going to go with with a radical number like nine, and I can't I can't quite remember when. Eleven fifty seven. All right. Eleven fifty seven. Um, and this and the rand was strengthening. It strengthened from about fourteen to eleven fifty seven. And I don't know what was happening to the dollar at the time because I don't have the time or the intellect to work it out. But this was in late twenty seventeen, early twenty eighteen. What was happening then? We were going to the ANC elective conference and um, Ramaphoria. But Ramaphoria quickly wore out, and then the rand sort of leveled off around the fourteen level, and then catastrophically this year blew out and blew out spectacularly what was the worst level the rand reached this year uh, wasn't it really close to about to about 19 to the dollar you're very good at this game Warren. very good at this game 1907 <laughs> 1907, 1907 on the 27th of april um, we went to 1907 um and again, I just to gain or and I know it's frustrating because you want answers and you want an exact answer. And I'm not too sure that there is an exact answer. What all that this does is gives you more or less buying power with your rands. Your global wealth is determined by the level of the rand versus other currencies, whether it's dollar strength or rand strength. Frankly, I'm not too sure that it makes all that much difference. Um, we would like more things to be going right for South Africa to make us more resilient. Would you agree, Warren, in the face of, of, of volatile uh, currency trading environments so that we don't see these massive whipsaws? But, yeah, it, it's been a, a crazy old year for the currency. We went from the beginning of 2020 and, you know, the first four months of the year, the rand went from 14 to 19. I mean, talk about a collapse. But we've gone in the same amount of time from 19 back to 15 and hopefully a little stronger. But anyway. On to the it's next a, one, Warren. Okay, last, yeah, last point. Okay. And then I'm, on to the last point. I think it's a, I, th- I think it's a good lesson for all of us, you know, that, that that we can't project that you know when the rand starts to blow out that it's now the beginning of a blow out trend that's going to last for the next decade. Uh, we we have to remember that the rand always moves in cycles, and it might be a one month cycle or a six month cycle or a three year cycle, but it does move in cycles. And I, I think we've actually said on the show at the time, you know, this too shall pass, and and guess what, it it has passed. 
Yeah, most certainly. Okay, Warren, then I would like to know, please, the difference between medical aid and a hospital plan. It's a terribly simple question, um, but a good question, because I think it's important that we understand it, especially at a time where you might be considering your options for 2021. Yeah, so so and it and it's a frightening topic because a lot of people are, are are you know planning to cancel their medical aids or hospital plans. So so just very simply, medical aid is is what uh, a lot of our parents would have been used to when they were growing up. You know that, that's when you're, you you know you've got this card and you go to the doctor and you, you know for for your your doctor's visit, your you know your dentist visit or hospital or something, you know, pretty much everything, you, you, you would be covered by, by medical aid, you know, and they would, they would pay some or most of the costs. Um, and, and then, you know, qu- quite a few years ago, things changed and, and, and these medical companies started, uh, new ones came into the market and they started to, to become a bit more clever and said, well, why do you pay for all that stuff? Why don't you just pay for, for the things that you need? For example, when you need to go to the hospital, you know, you, you can buy almost insurance from us and we'll, we'll cover your costs when you go to hospital. Um, but we're not going to cover your doctor's visits and your, you know, your glasses or, or whatever the, the, the dentist visits, uh, and and so so that's the primary thing that, that we need to understand. Nowadays, there are actually very few medical aids left. You know, there, there are a handful, but not many. Most uh, most of the things nowadays, these medical plans are actually hospital plans with a few tweaks added on top, where you can get a savings account that will pay for some of your dentist stuff or you know your your, your doctor's visits. But but most of the time. What you're actually buying is primarily insurance against you know big hospital costs uh, and 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 very little else, and, and so I think you, you know for for everybody I mean it doesn't matter who you are if you earn a salary and you and you you can somehow afford it you absolutely need a hospital plan it's just not the thing you want to cancel in 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 especially in a time like this but actually at any time of, of life if you're going to make sacrifices make them elsewhere but please don't make them. Uh, around your, your your hospital plans, and and you know the, the the reason for the difference between the two, unfortunately, medical aids are a heck of a lot more expensive than hospital plans. So if you're on a very expensive medical aid, then sure consider reducing to hospital plan, but please don't cancel a hospital plan. Thank you, Uncle Warren. Warren Ingram this evening from Galileo Capital. Uh, financial advisor at Galileo Capital and executive director there as well and contributor every Thursday well most Thursdays when he's not on holiday to the money show. Have a very good evening. We've got uh, that nice Ray White standing in tomorrow. I'll see you again on Monday. Good night.